Hi everybody, welcome to tonight's webinar with Dr. Eric Rees. My name is Vanessa and I am the UK Sales and Operations Manager for Iconia. Tonight, Dr. Eric is going to be concentrating on how you can really monetize the lasers in your clinical practice. We all know the therapeutic benefits of the laser, but at the end of the day, we want to, when we're invested in the laser, to maximize the revenue in our clinic. Um, Dr. Eric Rees has several of our lasers over in his clinic in the United States, and he's going to be sharing with you how he makes it a success within his practice. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the question box, and we will answer all questions at the end. This webinar will also be recorded if you want to recap on anything that Eric says throughout the webinar. So I'm going to hand you over to Eric and enjoy, and let's have plenty of questions, but like I say, we'll do them at the end. Awesome. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, if only people could have seen the last five, ten minutes of what Vanessa and I were trying to go through. I signed into the webinar, 15 minutes go by, still can't figure our audio out, so here I am talking on my cell phone. So if, if at some point anything goes haywire or you can't hear me, um, Vanessa will let me know and, and just alert Vanessa. But um, I want to thank everybody for going ahead and uh, attending the webinar tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be here again because uh, for those of you who've heard me speak before, you know that I'm just super passionate about uh, health and wellness and helping people help themselves. But more importantly, too, uh, as a provider and a clinician, um, I'm always looking for the best tools to help me help my patients. And I firmly believe not only in what uh, non-thermal low-level laser can do for our patients, but I mean, selfishly, like I, I use it on myself. I mean, I I use laser every single day on myself and I have a EVRL sitting right here in my desk because I'm selfish enough to know that I want to use it for myself, but I also use it with patients. And so I'm looking forward to speaking today about not only the clinical aspects of why laser is important, but to also talk about some of the important things for me clinically as well too, with regards to my clinic and, and, and functionality and how we make this thing really a tool and make it profitable. And so We'll talk about the mechanisms of laser. I don't think we can go through this enough. I think things are uh, just, just really important for us to understand the mechanisms behind what laser actually does to our cells, to our body, to inflammation. We'll talk about the neuroinflammatory cascade, what happens with trauma. For those of you who are working with trauma, which I would argue most of you are, this is a super important topic and aspect that we need to always own and understand. We'll talk about changes that happen with the nervous system too. So how do your autonomics become dysfunctional? How this alters blood flow, oxygenation, things that are really impacted by uh, different traumatic experiences. And then we're gonna talk about doing just different types of assessments, diagnostics, and really why low level, low level, excuse me, why low level laser is king um, or queen, depending on what you're looking at. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about the financial modeling and how these lasers can severely impact your bottom line in a very profitable way. Um, and for those of you who are, you know, clinic owners and business owners, understanding the importance of, you know, how impactful these lasers can be, not only for your patients, but to help you make more money. And then what we'll talk about, doctors are expensive to replicate. Like cloning yourself is not cheap by any means. And so in order for you to reap the maximum benefits of laser, uh, understanding the modeling of this is super imperative. So I love starting my lectures off with this slide because it really, at the end of the day, is fully encompassing for me as to what is your why? Um, and and this this is my why. Um, as you can see, uh, I lost my grandfather to Alzheimer's and cancer in 2014. It's so one of the most devastating things to happen to me and my family. He was one of the first people that I have, have, have lost. Um, and he was a mentor of mine. And it impacted me severely in a couple of ways. One, it was it was difficult to see this, the, the, you know, the massive changes that occurred between the time that I saw him, because I was living away from the Midwest back in the States, I was living in the West Coast, um, pursuing neurology and studying at a neuro practice. And so seeing those big changes was really difficult for me. He was a man that I respected and loved. And it, it worried me not only because of what I saw, but also knowing that I have a history of trauma. I have a history of playing hockey and football for most of my life, playing at competitive levels. And you know, I've had traumas that have resulted in me having Changes in my cognitive status. One of the big issues that I currently deal with right now that scares the hell out of my wife is the fact that I, in some way, shape, or form, at, at some moments will get overheated and I will lose consciousness. I lost consciousness in the tube uh, back in May of earlier this year. Not one of my finest moments, um, but, you know, I work out 
couple, multiple times a week. I take care of my body. I try and stay fit. And what really worries me or what makes me motivated to take care of these changes is the fact that I'm not perfect. And by being a doctor or patient first, a doctor second, and an advocate third, it's really changed my perspective because um, my, my wife and my family is my life. Um, I want to be able to live a life of zero regrets, be able to do things that I want to do, pursue my passions. And so I know a lot of you on this call want to do that as well, whether you're a provider or whether you're a business owner, whether you're somebody who's just on here just to learn. Uh, but more importantly, too, it's all about understanding how we can give our patients the best quality of life as well, uh, using the, the therapies, the knowledge, and the tools that we have at our dispersed. And so the question that always comes up is, why low-level, uh, non-thermal, low-level laser therapy? Well, to be fair, because it, it works. It works really well. And, and the mechanisms are relatively well understood. Um, I don't think we can ever take anything to the bank at this point in the game because you know, to be fair, we still can't really explain consciousness for the human brain. But what we know is that non-thermal low-level laser improves cellular function, and it specifically affects the mitochondria. And we're talking specifically about an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. This is the rate-limiting enzyme um, in the electron transport chain that allows our cells to produce ATP. Um, your, your brain and body spend up to two-thirds of your energy stores, ATP, just literally maintaining sodium-potassium pumps. And this energy, this ATP is powerful. It's the way that life works. And so what they've shown is that different types of experience have, have shown that low-level laser positively affects mitochondrial respiration. It can help you produce more ATP. It can protect RNA. It can produce more NADH, which, which is important for oxidative phosphorylation and, and aerobic respiration. There's also some theories out there showing that low-level laser therapy can have membrane stabilization effects. Why is that important? Well, look at what happens during the neuroinflammatory cascade of trauma. Uh, you have neurons that start going awry. You have changes in sodium and potassium and, and calcium across different ion channels. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but these are really important mechanisms for us. What's beautiful about non-thermal low-level laser therapy is that these photons, these billions and billions of photons, can travel past the different surfaces, and specifically, not only cell membranes, but even skin. And, and that's why this is so therapeutic and so impactful. And it's not just the local area. It actually has systemic effects as well. We were, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago about how you even shining laser on a specific body part can have effects in other areas. Um, but what's interesting with Herconia is they've done research with their um, emerald laser. And what they found is that even when they do body circumference low-level laser over the legs, they actually still have fat loss in other areas of the body. I mean, pretty remarkable, pretty incredible. And, and what they're showing is that it has systemic effects. And so non-thermal low-level laser therapy specifically affects the mitochondria. What happens is that these photons go into the cell. The mitochondria essentially upregulates its production of ATP. And, and it specifically uh, upregulates this fourth complex um, within the uh, mitochondrial respiratory transport chain. Because what happens is when you upregulate, it's the rate-limiting enzyme for producing ATP. All of this energy goes to allow your cells to be able to do things that they need to do, which is restore different aspects of DNA, get rid of the trash, dampen inflammatory responses. And why this is really important is because your mitochondria are essentially, you know, one of the main drivers, one of the main complexes for aging, for controlling inflammation, for altering your immune system. And we'll talk a little bit about that. What's important for us to understand, too, is that like blood sugar instability, different types of hypercholesterolemia, uh, obesity, and just chronic inflammation has a negative effect on your mitochondria. What, what is interestingly enough is that, you know, we give people um, different types of medications to lower their, their cholesterol. They're called statins. We give them statins. And actually what happens with a statin is it does lower your cholesterol, but it also affects your ability to produce ATP. Should you utilize low-level laser therapy in some way, shape, or form to help people possibly have more energy if they're taking statins? Maybe. We don't know. We haven't done the research yet, but there's a really strong hypothesis there for that. And how many people are on statins these days? I mean, we're talking millions and millions of patients. Why low-level laser therapy is really therapeutic is that the photons go in the cell, they, they affect the mitochondria, but what they do is they essentially kick off nitric oxide and allow oxygen to bind to the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme. What happens with that is it produces a byproduct of water and, and nitric oxide. Well, water is always needed and very therapeutic for us. 
What's also important with this too is that nitric oxide is a local vasodilator. What does that mean? Well, it dilates your vasculature, allowing you to bring more blood and more, more oxygen, more nutrients um, to the area that's being affected. Um, why is that important? Well, we know in trauma that those systems can become decoupled. And so low level laser therapy can be very therapeutic because it allows more tissue perfusion to the areas of its use. On top of that too, we know that low level laser can be really effective for different uh, cellular aspects with repair, with cellular proliferation, cellular migration, and cellular adhesions. It can halt negative consequences, right? like, like cell death. And why this is powerful is because it's not just in your blood or it's not just in your skin. Like we're talking a positive impact on neural tissue, bone, muscles and joints, your skin, connective tissue, blood. I mean, the outcomes are vast and, and they're all over the place. And so what's beautiful about what Erconia has done is not only have they done the research and having 21 of the 24 FDA approved patents for clinical use of low level laser, but on top of that too, also, they have FDA approvals for so many different things. So, you know, neck pain, low back pain, shoulder pain, plantar fasciitis, post-operative surgery. They're also doing research into things like neurodegenerative conditions. They're doing research into things like neurodevelopmental issues. And some of the research coming out is relatively promising. Um, so what's beautiful about this is that this is essentially a tool that you can use in your tool belt to help your patients because here's the issue that we're facing is that we're all dealing with inflammation in some way, shape, or form. And this is the new title that they're giving it, is they're giving it inflammaging. And here's the question, why us? Well, we know your mitochondria are involved in multiple factors throughout your health and your wellness, producing energy, cellular uh, connections, uh, controlling your immune system, steroid and hormonal and even heme biosynthesis, controlling inflammation. They're massively, massively important in regulating your immune system as well. And so what happens is that your mitochondria become affected when there's massive amounts of pro-inflammatory meters that are created, specifically C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and fibrinogen. Remember interleukin-6 for the later discussion, because this is something that, that low-level laser specifically can decrease or shunt or, or stop in its tracks. We know that higher levels of inflammation are, are correlated with higher levels or accelerated levels of aging. This is just a fact, and this is why everyone's looking at NAD plus supplements, so looking at using fisetin and quercetin and all of these different molecules to try and halt aging is they're trying to support mitochondrial function. Well, what if you have a bad gut or a leaky, leaky blood-brain barrier, or you can't absorb nutrients well? What would be a really quick way to probably dampen inflammation in the brain and body? By using low-level laser therapy. And here we go, right? So interleukin-6 levels are used as a predictive marker for aging. Interleukin-1 beta levels are indicative of chronic inflammation and activation of the immune system. We know that these inflammatory processes are going on in the background. This is a problem because when you have inflammation, it's essentially like taking your mitochondria and dipping it in a little bit of gasoline every time, right? You don't know when that match is going to go. The problem with that is that we're all dealing with inflammation in some way, shape, or form. On top of that, we're also finding out that mitochondrial function decreases 50% overall with its ability to perform mito or respiratory um, electron transport chain respiratory mechanisms for producing ATP. It, those decrease over time. And so the problem with this is we have to ask the question, like, what is normal aging? Um, my grandmother is 94 years old, is still living on her own, is walking and talking and independent, goes to the casino with her lovely sisters, and, and, and doesn't have any issues whatsoever. That's how I want to live. That's how I want to age as well. My other grandparents aren't doing as well. My grandmother had a large stroke in 2020. My grandfather isn't doing as well either on that. My grandmother actually broke her hip uh, about six or eight months ago. I mean, how do you want to age? I mean, we know that chronic inflammation can have massive effects on these mechanisms. And so we have to talk about this bit because this is really important for us. Traumatic events can induce inflammation. And even if you don't have a specific traumatic event, in some way, shape, or form, changes in your metabolic capacity can induce inflammatory responses, and they're all going to alter mitochondrial function. This, this picture is specifically depict, depicting what happens during like a concussion or a head injury. 
And so you see changes in these ions, these sodium, potassium, and, and these calcium-gated ion channels going back and forth. You have alterations in ATP production. And essentially what happens is this all affects the mitochondria in some way, shape, or form. I hope you see a common thread of what we're talking about. We're talking about mitochondrial function being the bedrock and the rate limiting factor to every single mechanism that we're talking about with aging and controlling inflammation and altering your immune response. We know that trauma changes your nervous system as well. Your autonomic nervous system affects nearly every single organ and tissue throughout your brain and body. The problem is that when trauma is present, your autonomic nervous system becomes skewed and altered. And what happens is we have these massive changes of chemicals that are being released, these stress responses. We know that there's massive amounts of immune changes that occur. We know that there's inflammatory cascades that occur. Interleukin-6, right? Interleukin-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of these mechanisms and all of these cytokines come out and just wreak havoc on our brains and bodies. We also know that there are different types of hormonal axes that are, that are affected. The, the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, can be, can be severely affected as well too. And so what do we do about that? As a provider, what do these patients actually look like? Well, maybe you'd see elevations in heart rate. Maybe you'd see elevations in blood pressure. Maybe you'd see changes in digestion. If you're looking at your patients in the eyes, what are you gonna see? Maybe you see bigger pupils. These are all sympathetic nervous system responses. These are all fight or flight responses because your nervous system is, is kind of split up between these two. It's kind of the yin and the yang. So. With your fight or flight or freeze response, you have this massive catecholamine surge, this stress response that occurs. But the opposite of that is your parasympathetic, your rest and digest components. And these are really what are associated with, with your vagus nerve and increased vagal tone. And so you need this yin and the yang, and they're not just one's on and one's off, and, and they switch back and forth. They're always kind of on pulling on each other and causing tension back and forth in the brain and body. But this is where things get really interesting, is because what we're finding out is that when we start doing activities structurally, neurologically, even nutritionally, or even using different types of tools like low-level laser to optimize vagal nerve tone, we can see massive changes in the brain and body because your vagus nerve is your wandering nerve, and it literally controls everything from the middle of your throat down to the large part of your large intestine. And it has a massive impact on this because not only do you have information coming in from all those visceral organs, you have information going out. Of an interesting note, um, information going in from all of these visceral tissues going into the brainstem goes into this neural integration center called the nucleus tractus solitarius, and it's in the medulla. What's interesting about that area of the brain is that it's also implicated in depression. It's also implicated in some neuropsychiatric disorders. Well, how, why? area of the frontal lobe called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex integrates with your nucleus tractus solitarius. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. So the, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex integrates with your right nucleus tractus solitarius. Could we maybe make a theory that having increased vagal tone could positively increase people's cognitive performance or their emotions? Yes, they're actually doing the research on this. So it's not crazy to think about that. What you have to understand is that everything is connected and your brain is just this master computer. Having trauma to the brain or having concussion is like me pouring water on my laptop. I can't tell you what's gonna exactly happen. That's why I have to check every system out and see maybe my Microsoft Word's working, but my PowerPoint's down. I have to update that software as specific as I can. Same thing that you do clinically, but at the end of the day, what we know is that some sort of inflammatory, some sort of change in your immune response, and some sort of alteration in your mitochondria is inevitably going to happen. What's beautiful about the vagus nerve is that we actually still don't fully understand the vagus nerve. We know that there are inputs and that there are outputs from these vagal tone or these vagal centers. 80% of the information is actually going into your brain and only 20% goes out. But what's beautiful about that is that there are anti-inflammatory mechanisms uh, dealing with the vagus nerve and the vagal nerve uh, complex because there's a little bit more going on than just saying it's just the vagus nerve, right? But there are several mechanisms that have been identified. The first one is the anti-inflammatory stimulation via the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. What happens is your vagus nerve goes and stimulates the HPA axis. You have a release of cortisol in a beneficial way, not in the chronically stressed kind of activated way, but in a beneficial way it actually suppresses inflammatory responses. 
This is the same mechanism of you having something going on with like a tendinopathy in your knee and your doctor or your GP giving you a cortisone shot. Well, that's great because it could actually dampen that response, but what's the problem with cortisone sh or shots and responses? You can't have too many of them because they start breaking down the tissue. It's the same thing that cortisol does in your brain and body with a chronically stressed state. The second mechanism of the anti-inflammatory property of vagal nerve stimulation is this cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. Essentially what happens is acetylcholine is released from the vagus nerve. It binds to macrophages, right? So these are immune cells. They bind to these alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And what they do is they decrease the amount or they inhibit the release of tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, there's that term again. What do we talk about? Interleukin-6, interleukin-1 beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Three prominent pro-inflammatory mediators that are well-known actors in the process of aging, inflammation, and altering immune responses. The third mechanism is pretty interesting because with stimulation of the vagus nerve, you actually have stimulation of the sympathetic system. And the sympathetic splenic ganglion, or the splenic sympathetic nerve, actually releases norepinephrine, which binds to the same receptors um, on lymphocytes, these, these uh, alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Pretty powerful mechanisms. Well, interestingly enough, we know that your vagus nerve is sensitive to these pro-inflammatory cytokines that we talked about. We talked about them with inflammation. Interleukin-1, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. They did an interesting research study where they induced septic shock in rodents using lipopolysaccharides. And for those of you who do a lot of functional medicine, lipopolysaccharides, right? So these gram-negative bacteria that live in your gut, that when they get into your bloodstream, they have a neurotoxic effect on the brain and body. And so if you have a leaky gut barrier that opens up and or inevitably a leaky blood-brain barrier, these lipopolysaccharides just start promoting rampant inflammation. They can actually trigger depression, anxiety, different types of neurocognitive issues. Septic shock was prevented by vagal nerve stimulation in a lipopolysaccharide model with rodents. That's how powerful this anti-inflammatory pathway is. Well, I have a question for you. What does vagal nerve stimulation look like? Here's a great example of this, right? So this is an FX635 laser. This is a patient of mine. She's got vagal nerve clips on her ears. She's doing vagal nerve therapy over her gut. And when I'm with patients, for the most part, what I'm doing is I'm doing this skin on skin because you want the maximum absorption. The question always comes up, should we do laser skin on skin? And my answer to that is yes. But if you have to, use, use, clothes, use clothing because your patients aren't comfortable or it's a tough area to get to you're still gonna get the benefits of the laser. It's kind of like me taking sand and throwing it through a chain link fence. Some of that sand won't make it through, but for the most part, a lot of it will. And so stimulating the vagus nerve is super easy with low level laser therapy. All you do is you turn it on and you point and you shoot. The frequencies that Arconia has are all therapeutic. They're in the peak absorption rate for being able to have the cells upregulate ATP production but I'm always getting patients to do other things. What else would be involved with vagal nerve therapy or vagal nerve tone? Belly breathing, humming. There's there ways to stimulate different types of things like digestion, salivation. We use some things like essential oils, things like that, to try and stimulate olfactory receptors, to try and stimulate these lower brainstem areas to start maybe changing vagal tone. Yeah, right? Even heat and cold exposure can be really powerful ways. Why do you see people taking cold plunges and using saunas these days? It's because it has a massive effect on your autonomics in a very positive way. And so we know by stimulating your vagus nerve that you can alter and you can stimulate different aspects of the anti-inflammatory responses, right? We know that trauma is going to alter your immune responses based off of that. And, and this is a great article. And this is a great depiction of it. What happens is you have trauma to the brain and body. You have changes in immune modulation. You become immunosuppressed. Your gut barriers, your brain barriers, and even your lung barriers break down. You're prone to infections, and all of a sudden, you have this rampant positive feedback loop. Opportunistic infections and septic infections are one of the biggest problems that people deal with, and one of the reasons why brain injuries and traumas are, are fatal is because the nervous system is in shock, and then what happens is the immune system and the inflammatory systems take over, and now these patients are prone to secondary tertiary infections, right? What is C. diff, right? It's an opportunistic infection in the hospital. A lot of people pass away from it. This is a tough thing for a lot of individuals with traumatic events because we know it also affects your HPA axis. Well, 
we just talked about this. If we can, if we have alterations in your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, could we do something to potentially reset or rebalance that? Yeah, we could probably stimulate your vagus nerve in some way, shape, or form. What's well, a pretty easy way for you to stimulate the vagus nerve? Well, level A's with therapy, probably a good start to that. What are other ways? Belly breathing exercises, humming, singing, salivation, right? You can reset some of these mechanisms because your brain and the networks in your nervous system are all connected. And, and this is what happens during shock, is your HP axis becomes skewed, you start promoting different inflammatory mediators, and all of a sudden you can get this thing called central nervous system induced immune deficiency syndrome. I've seen patients with this, and it's very difficult to get them out of that state, regardless of the tools and mechanisms that you have. Don't let your patients get there, because there's a massive connection between these inflammatory responses, your immune system, and your gut and your brain. And for those of you who haven't heard about the gut-brain or the brain-gut connection, have you been living under a rock? Because this is a massive, massive thing that a lot of people are talking about right now. The central nervous system is your master controller of the gut and of the brain, and it's a two-way street. I love this article because it continues to justify and showcase how impactful the gut-brain and the brain-gut connection really is. And so what, we're, what they did here is they did a, this was a journal of, of neurotrauma in 2009. What they did is they induced brain injuries in rats. And what they did is they did a cross-section of the gut after that brain injury. They didn't touch the gut. They, what they did is they caused a brain injury. And this is what it looked like. Okay, the top photo is what a normal gut mucosa should look like. It should have a lot of microvilli, a lot of surface area. It should look protected, right? Your, your gut epithelium is only one cell thick. And so what happened within six hours of a brain injury, we see a massive change in the protection in the gut mucosa of those rats. And that was only within six hours. Imagine what happens within days, weeks, sometimes even months for those patients that you see, or even years who haven't had the changes. Maybe they have bad diet. They're not exercising, not sleeping well. Their brain's still on fire. They've got all this inflammation going on. So this is a massive problem for people because once your gut becomes altered, your brain becomes altered as well. The same gap junction proteins, occluded and zonulin, that occupy those, those gut barriers in your gut are the same ones that occupy those barriers in your brain. And now you're set up for failure because now you can have things like food sensitivities, allergies, autoimmunities, right? different things that are going to promote chronic inflammation. And here's the picture. So we have these tight junctions disrupted in the gut, which lead to tight junctions disrupted in the brain. We have an immune and inflammatory response that occurs. We have changes in brain cells. Now you start losing brain cells at a ra rapid rate. That's called neurodegeneration. And you see, once again, this pro-inflammatory cytokine storm, interleukin-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6. It's the same story every single time. And it comes back to mitochondrial dysfunction. So here we are, right? What do you think you can do as a provider? We know that low-level laser therapy can reduce pro-inflammatory cytokine production. In closed, house, um, in closed head uh, TBI mouse models, they've actually shown that low-level laser therapy can, can prevent the occurrence of secondary brain injury by suppressing those pro-inflammatory markers. We also think that it might have a microglial effect as well. And what's interesting with this is that Marconi is actually doing research on this right now in uh, neurodevelopmental um, disorders, specifically looking into autism. Um, and so we can't say anything about it yet, but I think the research will be really enlightening. I think what we need to understand is that these mechanisms are there. Marconia is amazing and brilliant for doing this because they're putting the reputation on the line to showcase what their lasers can do. But remember, these studies aren't cheap. I mean, on average, it takes about a million dollars to do the double-blind, placebo-controlled, multivariate level one studies that, that they're doing to even get them through to the FDA. And so it's really important to know that this whole complex really comes down to understanding how not only your nervous system controls inflammation, but, but how you respond to it and what you can do as a provider. So we know that shock, this different type of stress and trauma is going to have an effect on your gut on your brain, and, and more importantly, on these inflammatory and these immune components that we've been talking about. What I think is interesting is that we know that vagal nerve stimulation can be anti-inflammatory and can be preventative. It, it, can, it can be something that you can use proactively. And this is how simple it is. This could be how simple it is, is having an FX635 or a laser set up on your patient's gut 
or over the neck, right? We know that the, the vagal nerve comes out around the carotid on the side of the neck on both sides because you have two of them. And you set it and forget it. For you as a clinician, and we'll talk about the ROI, this is massive for you because you don't have to hire anybody else. You don't have to duplicate yourself or clone yourself. You can literally use the laser to work with two patients at once. When one patient's on the laser, you can work with the other patient doing therapy or structural work or soft tissue modalities. And then when you're done, they can switch. And what it does is it allows you to multiply yourself without having to hire somebody else and saying it's another expense. And I'm not saying that associates are a bad idea because I was an associate for a very long time, but what this does is it allows you to have the freedom and also the scalability to be able to optimize your clinic. Not only improve your clinical outcomes, but also maximize your opportunity to be able to live and build, and build a quality practice. We know vagal nerve stimulation affects inflammation. And why this is interesting is because we're using vagal nerve stimulation to start treating rheumatoid arthritis. A chronic autoimmune inflammatory response because of its ability to suppress tumor necrosis factor alpha. We also know that low level laser suppresses tumor necrosis factor alpha. And this is why we're coming back to this over and over again, is because not only can these tools be really effective with controlling inflammation, but to be fair, most of my patients can't even handle some of the therapy that I want to do with them. If they just got a concussion or a brain injury and they're light sensitive and they can't move or even be like talking with my hands and they're like, oh, doc, I'm getting busy. Most of them can't even handle some of the therapies that I want to give them. So using a passive modality not only expands my ability to help more patients, but I know it's a non-invasive approach that really has no side effects. Now, why this is important is that we know injury, oxidative stress, and inflammation, specifically as it relates to changing the immune system, is essentially you know, the ingredients to set us up for nerve regeneration. And this is my why as to why I continue to do lectures and why I'm passionate about this space is that I saw what my grandfather went through. I saw what my family went through with the emotions that they felt. It's pretty easy for me to take the EVRL every day and put it over my neck, put it over my gut, put it over my head, because I know it's worth it. I don't have to do anything. Most of the time I'm just sitting at my laptop, being the nerd that I am, hanging out, and just working on things while I'm getting my laser on my head. I mean, it's that simple and that's, it's that easy. And like I said, I'm selfish enough to get a laser to do it for myself, let alone for my patients. I like to think that there's probably a lot of you out there who are in the same boat with that. And so something else that I think is interesting that we're looking into as well is vagal nerve stimulation can actually benefit people cognitively. It can improve autonomic function, quality of life scores, mood, and even sleep. We know that vagal nerve stimulation can actually improve heart rate variability. And this is a massive indicator for quality of life, your ability to recover. Without going into too much detail on that, uh, vagal nerve stimulation in the traditional sense is very invasive. I don't think many of you on this call are going to be doing vagal nerve stimulator implants anytime soon, but this is what it looks like. This is where they go into the side of the neck, most of the time on the left side, but sometimes on the right side. They cut open your neck. Your vagus nerve wraps around the carotid sheath of your, of your carotid artery. And what happens is they put a vagal nerve stimulator on there. Well, that sounds great in theory, but there's actually a lot of side effects. Um, there's actually a lot of issues with going into the neck that side because your neck it has a lot of coveted receptors going into the brain, but also, too, it's a pretty coveted area for us. So if you had an option to do non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation or non-invasive low-level laser therapy and affecting the vagus nerve, would you do it? I'd like to think so. And this is what they've done. Cliff Machado did a great study out of Cuba showing that vagal nerve stimulation using the EVRL, the Arconia EVRL laser, showed massive effects in QEEG results in patient after patient after patient. And what was really cool with this is that this low-level laser was only applied to the neck for 10 minutes. And what they showed that was that red and violet low-level laser could be useful in conditions like depression, anxiety, neurorehabilitation, really anything that we talked about because it can increase brain activity and it can couple blood flow with neurological activity. And what's also cool with this is that we know that low-level laser therapy can stimulate parasympathetic activity. All the anti-inflammatory pathways we just talked about, all the immune modulating aspects, all the uh, inflammatory, inflammatory and suppression of interleukin-6, interleukin interleukin-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of these things are fair game. So where does that leave us? Well, regardless of the type of provider that you are, you are a receptor-based provider. Brain and body are always taking in information and giving inputs and out, taking in inputs and giving you outputs. 
doesn't matter if you're using medication, supplements, manual therapies, low-level laser, light, sound, whatever. So this is important for us to understand is that what you do with your patients matters. And, and at the end of the day, this is the question we have to ask is what are best practices not only for you as a therapist, but also for your clinic's balance sheet? How do you stay in business? Because if you can't stay in business, then you can't help patients. And so outside of some of the traditional things for optimizing your clinical outcomes, I want to talk a little bit about the, 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 the business aspect. Like what is your ROI? What is your return on investment as a provider? What is your job as a provider? Well, well as a therapist, your job is to be able to help your patients, right? But what about those of you who are business owners? You got to stay open, right? You got to be able to float your company. You got to be able to make sure you keep the doors open to help the patients that are coming in to see you. But these don't have to be mutually exclusive. You know, to be fair, how, what's the traditional way to increase patient flow or to increase, you know, business? The traditional model is to hire employees or other docs. But is this always the best strategy? Or if you get a doc in that doesn't do as well as you do, or a doc that doesn't do well with patients as well as you thought they did, and you got to fire them, and you got to hire them, and you got to train them, and do all these things, and is this really the only strategy that's available to you? Well, I'm going to make a heavy argument that it's really not. I, I didn't have uh, an associate in my clinic for the first two years of my practice, and the first thing I bought was an EBRL because I knew the functionality of it, and I knew how important it was for me. The other thing that I bought after that was an FX635 because I wasn't ready to bring on an associate. I wanted to do things my own way. I wanted to keep things really clean and really simple. And what that did is it allowed me to scale and grow my clinic to the point where I was seeing two patients at a time, booking every 15, 30 minutes, and being able to not only build services for those patients, but made my life so much easier too, because I could truly focus my time and my energy on those patients in front of me. I want you to ask yourself, how much does it cost you to replace yourself as a provider? I got this from the British Chiropractic Association. Starting salaries for a new Cairo are 30,000 pounds a year. Now, they say after you know, several years, you can get up to 80 to 100,000 K, but what about for those seasoned docs? What about for an associate? How much does that cost you as a clinic owner? We'll say, we'll say 30,000 30, pounds to, just to start off on that. What if you get a physio? I took this from Indeed. The average physiotherapist in the UK makes 36,000 euro or 36,000 pounds a year. Now, that's average, right? So there's clearly going to be more, more than that. There could be people who are less than that as well, too. But what does it cost for a GP? If you want to maximize your, your patient overload, uh, what, what if you wanted to hire a GP? It could be 70,000 pounds. What if you wanted to hire a surgeon? It could be 77,000 pounds to hire an associate surgeon or a surgeon to be in your practice, to be bringing in more billable services to build to the NHS or wherever you're located in the world. You don't have to always do that, though. I mean, if you take a look at how low-level laser therapy can clone you and simultaneously generate profits, I made this chart, okay? So even with seeing five patients a day, okay, five patients a day, that's 20 patient visits a week on a four-day work week. Here's what, the, here's what the totals average out to. Let's say it's 50, 50 pounds of treatment or even 30 pounds of treatment. I even went lower than this on the other charts. That's 4,000 pounds a month. That's 48K in revenue. And after the deduction of even the laser, you still have 16,000 pounds left over. The second year is, is just complete profit on top of that because it's taking the first year profits and then rolling it over into the second year profits too. I mean, you're up to 64K. And in some of these models, what I did, because there's going to be some of you who are like, I don't charge 50 pounds or 30 pounds for, for a laser treatment. There's all these different models and variables here that I gave you. And so let me get back to this other slide here. Let's try even going to 10 patients a day, okay? Even 10 patients a day, still four-day work week, right? Same rates. You make it 8K a month just by bringing the laser into your practice. Could that pay for the associate that you just hired? Probably. Could that pay for you not having an associate and maximizing and expanding your ability to help more patients? Probably. These annual revenues are pretty remarkable, 96,000 pounds. And after your first year, after you take a laser in the cup, 64K still, right? I mean, look at the grading of all of these charts. Now, let's say you're seeing 15 patients a day, right? I mean, the numbers are staggering, 144K. You're seeing 15 patients a day. You're working a four-day work week. You're charging 50 pounds for that laser treatment, right? 
just the laser treatment by itself, maybe all the other services are billable through insurance, but you're only charging for laser. I mean, this is remarkable. This could be a game-changing opportunity for your practice. Let's say for those of you who are only seeing 10 patients a day and you're only billing out 20 or 30 pounds for that laser treatment, okay? Even in the worst estimates, you're still making 3,200 pounds a month using that laser by itself, not hiring anybody, not doing anything else. You're taking your annual revenues and increasing them by 38 to 57,000 pounds a year. And even after the first year of profit, you're still making profit. Even with a base station, you're still making 12,000 pounds of profit. I mean, these are remarkable statistics. This is the reason why I bought my lasers when I did it, because I wanted to maximize my revenue and my profits while also helping my patients. My patients have never, ever complained about utilizing the laser or being on the laser in my practice because they're getting better with it, and they know why I'm doing it, and they understand the reason why, and they've never once questioned why we're doing that because at the end of the day, it's allowed me to give more time and more energy to them. And so, first of all, everyone's going to have access to these slides and these charts. I'm happy sharing them. I know that there are specials that Vanessa and Simon are running this month as well, too. So, these numbers are general and basic, but what I want to tell you is that before the end of the year, this is the time to buy because things are on sale. And so, what I want to do is I want to break for, for questions and comments, but Vanessa, I'm, I want you to touch maybe on some of the specials that you're having for the remainder of 2022 so you can give people maybe a little bit more of a baseline as to some of the price points and some of the opportunities that they have in front of them that may, I may not have mentioned. For sure. So thank you so much. Um, I hope that gave you, well, everyone who's listening, a real insight into how they can really earn a significant revenue from incorporating the lasers into their practice. Eric is right. Um, now, well, up until the end of the year, is really the time to invest. So we have got 22% off across the handheld lasers. So that will be the EVRL and the Accelerate. That's 22% off, obviously, to mark the end of 2022. Um, and that is only available until the 31st of December. Um, so looking at, obviously, Eric's figures on the um, screen there, with a 22% reduction, um, you have a significant saving. Um, I will tell you that we'll never do an offer as good as this. Um, we have never done an offer as good as this, um, but we're obviously just rounding up the end of the year with that offer. Um, if anybody, I know there's a few names on um, tonight who have inquired before and have maybe been a bit hesitant about investing, maybe it wasn't the right time. Um, we do offer third party financing as well, so we can look to spread the cost out over three, four or five years. To get you kind of a rough idea of what a monthly finance repayment will be for something like the accelerate you're looking at approximately 200 250 um plus vat per month and obviously when you maximize the lasers in your practice you're going to be earning a lot more than that um, and you're going to be helping a lot more patients as well and you'll be able to maximize the results as well so if anyone wants to find out more or even just look at a a finance quote to see what it's going to be costing you on a monthly basis please just reach out to myself um i will drop everybody an email tomorrow morning anyways with my contact details on there so please do reach out um and we can look at how much it's going to cost you and then we can also look at how much revenue that's going to bring back into the business um as a company as well we support you in the after sales process so you receive full access to a marketing um, guide that we've put together for you and you receive access to a marketing portal um, so that you can obviously fully maximize the lasers in your practice. Um, I've got one um, doctor now who joined us, I think, in a seminar back in March um, this year. And they started with an EVRL and they have just recently last month purchased their second EVRL because they are so busy. They're getting fantastic results. They've actually brought another member of staff on board as well and they need the two lasers. Um, so that's kind of the growth that we look at um, as a company. And there's loads of other things that we can talk you through, for example, renting the lasers out to your patients. Let's say if you have an elderly patient that can't get in two, three times a week or you just don't have the appointment space, there are a lot of additional um, ways that we can really, really maximize the bottom line as a business. Um, if anyone has any questions, either put them in the chat 
or feel free to reach out to myself or Eric tomorrow and uh, we can kind of have a one-on-one -on -one chat with you and obviously see how we best can make a bespoke package to suit uh, your clinic. Yeah, Vanessa, you touched on one thing that I wanted to um, elaborate a bit on is uh, the, the laser rental aspect. In my, in my clinic in the States, um, I have handhelds that I rent out to patients for $800 a month. Um, and most patients like to take that offer because they're either not local or they know that they can get all the benefits of the laser by having it at home without having to drive to come see me. What's great about that is that that laser is literally making me money in my sleep. I don't have to be present. It's just a complete, you know, cash income for me. And patients love it too because then they can stay at home, do their treatments, they get better. And over time, they end up, you know, not really needing to have to do that for a super long time because they are getting the therapeutic benefits of it. And so it's nice for me to be able to have that. And that's why I have multiple lasers is because the ROI has just been there for me from day one. I mean, looking at these charts, you're, you're going to pay this laser off in the first year if you're using it and you are utilizing it in the way that, that we've suggested. And what's great about Vanessa and Simon and everybody with the EMEA or Konia team is that they support you along the way. I mean, we have WhatsApp chats, like we have groups. We're always talking to each other about, hey, I have a question about this. How are you doing this? Like there are always ways to get supported on this. And Vanessa, you guys are honestly, you're top notch at doing that. So um, anybody who's hesitant, like Vanessa said, happy to have a conversation with Vanessa. I'm an open book. I'm happy to discuss my clinical aspects, what I've seen in my clinic, how I can help people over, um, you know, get through over the hurdle and, and bring laser into their office or buy another one. Um, you know, one of the things that I found with the handheld is that, um, you know, I was able to utilize these technologies. What was what really took my uh, my clinic to the next level was, was getting a stand, because what I realized is when I had the FX635, I was able to just set it and forget it, and I could leave my patients there. There's three diodes. I know they're getting the therapeutic benefit of that. And I can walk away, see other patients, and it maximized my clinic even more than it was already with that first laser. And so there's so many different aspects that go into it, but just understand that this is such a good investment and the tool will pay off dividends for the rest of your clinical experience. Um, and you probably even then some because you should be using this on yourself too, right? So yes, you should use it for your patients, but like get a little selfish and use it on yourself because we all have things that we're working on. So I can't emphasize that enough. And um, hopefully uh, people uh, are interested or at least uh, open to having a conversation with us because we're more than happy to have that conversation with you too. Yeah, exactly. Like I think any investment you make into your business, there is, um, it's scary initially because, you know, it's, it's a significant outlay. However, it's our responsibility and our job to help you um, return that investment as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, just to kind of recap, we have 22% off the handhelds until the end of December. Stock is extremely limited, um, and I know there are quite a lot of interested parties at the moment anyways. Um, but yeah, just reach out to me. Um, we've just got one question. Yeah, there will be a replay. Um, everybody who signed up for this will receive the recording tomorrow. Um, so you can recap through the numbers. If you missed anything due to bad connection, you can obviously read through that. And Yes, the lasers can be used on animals and we get really great results. Um, animals really like it as well because there's no heat, um, so they don't feel any discomfort or any pain. Um, and we have like an animal protocol book that we um, send you along with the laser. Um, so yeah, if nobody has any more questions tonight, um, I just want to say thank you, Eric. And I really hope that you, 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 know, you guys start thinking about how you can really, really um, use the laser to Right. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Vanessa. You. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks, bye. Bye. Um, do you... Hang on.